The Five Nights at Treasure Island series has a long and complicated history full of demos and cancelled projects, with the very first official game of the series taking a whole six years of development before the final product was finally released, with it receiving quite positive reviews and feedback from its long form fan base due to being one of the first FNAF fan games ever made. People obviously wanted more. However, in cases like this when there's a game that's so well loved, the sequels typically become messy and not able to live up to the hype of the original. But like I said, this is what typically happens. Oblitus Casa is the official sequel to this franchise, and wow. Not only am I shocked that I never saw any of the gameplay before trying it out for myself, I was shocked at the production and dedication this one game had behind it, with the final version of this game being released on September 29th, 2023. This was one of the most terrifying sequels I have ever played. You'll end up just like the last one. <laughs> Before we even start the game off, we get thrown into a cutscene of what appears to be some sort of doctor or therapist talking to a man called Jake Smith. If you aren't familiar with the series already, or have forgotten after watching my first video on the history of the previous entry, Jake Smith was the name of the character we played as in the first game. At the time of this audio recording, it is December 1st, 2004, and it's being used to help with the Discovery Island case. Just a year prior, we were declared missing during the quote unquote Discovery Island incident incident, only to be found on July 23rd, 2004, where we were taken into custody as we were showing signs of delusion and paranoia. With us being the only current suspect for the disappearances of Greg, Lisa, and Henry, the three other individuals who came to Treasure Island with us. What's strange is that those signs of delusion and paranoia could be directly tied to the ending of the previous game, where Jake went down to the depths of pirate caverns only to find a drawing board. Confused as to exactly why he was told to come down here, only to be confronted by an entity simply called Mother. We don't know exactly what happens after this scene yet, but after this incident, we are told about a cabin. Drawing some sort of importance to it since it's where Jake has been presumably hiding for an entire year. Which is when we're finally thrown into the actual game. For night one, we look around this place which seems to be the same cabin that was mentioned prior. There's no phone calls, no text boxes, nothing that really tells us what to do. But after looking around for a bit, we can notice three tools. For one, there is this notepad to our right that will explain some important things at the beginning of each night. I just want to quickly state that this was such a genius change from the usual phone calls that most FNAF fan games try to feel obligated to use. Not that the idea of the phone calls themselves are a negative thing, but just the fact that they almost felt as if they were becoming stale due to how often you'll see this trend repeated. It also immerses you more within the game itself, making you feel as though you are inside that cabin trying to figure things out for yourself. Especially how there's no real introduction at all, and you're just thrown in forced to look for some answers on what exactly you need to do, only amplifying the fear that you feel as you become more afraid of doing something wrong. Now, to talk about what was actually inside that notepad, with the first being that the three friends we came to the island with, and who authorities are currently looking for, are most likely not alive anymore. But whoever left this note here is trying to help us. The second piece of information is the music box within the cameras distracts Willy, a tune that I'll talk about soon, with the final thing mentioned being to check on this notepad quite frequently. At first, I believe this was due to the notes changing as the night progressed, but that's not the case. Instead, as time passes, this drawing will become more and more filled. Once this entity draws herself completely into existence, she will physically form within the office, but won't actually directly jump scare the player. Instead, she will shut off all the lights, then cause them to flicker constantly while screaming, causing all the other enemies to become more aggressive and rush into the office much quicker. This might as well be an automatic game over since you won't be able to access the attic either, causing you to be trapped at the base floor of the cabin. 
which is where we can make it to the second part of what we could find by just looking around. On our left side are these stairs where we could go up to the dark attic while giving us access to a lighter. For now, there's no reason for us to care about this location, but that'll soon change. In the middle of the room is a camera system, which gives us access to two things, which are the music box and the camera flash. What's interesting to note is that the music box cannot regenerate itself at all and has a health bar for each individual room, causing you to need to plan out which rooms you want to exhaust the music in since eventually you'll need to change courses in which direction you want Willy to walk towards. In the previous game, photo negative Mickey was essentially the mascot, however, in this game, Steamboat Willy is a new icon. This was an actual character Disney created and was featured in the very first film that starred the icon, Mickey Mouse, in 1928. Also, making it one of the most influential animation films of all time due to it popularizing cartoons with synchronized sounds. Since during that time period, silent films were what most people were used to. So, to make the decision to essentially remove most of the iconic Treasure Island characters in favor of a new cast, I genuinely believe that this was a step in the right direction as it allows for a lot more creativity as a whole instead of being limited to only the quote unquote normal characters. Though many fans still didn't like this change. Willy will enter from cam 1 which is the entrance of the cabin and try to reach you in your room all the way at the bottom left, making his movement simple to read since all he could do is walk straight towards you. I do want to quickly mention cam 9 which shows what appears to be some sort of dock outside that also has yellow police strips saying do not cross. We can even see this from the room we're currently in outside of the window. For now though, all we need to worry about is making sure Willy doesn't get to us and to erase Belial, which is the name of that character getting drawn, every few seconds to get rid of her. This night can't just end normally though. Mother attacks us and leads us to the postmortem room. This is a room that will happen every time you get jump scared and gives you a second chance of beating the night. For the end of the first night, this will always happen, and you cannot progress without beating this new feature. However, for any other nights, you will really only have one more chance or else it's game over. To beat this mini game, you'll need to collect a certain amount of Mickey Mouse heads on the camera systems that will appear randomly. We have this best friend who seems to be a doll of Mickey Mouse that we need to poke with the needle every time Mickey or Oswald shows up. The headless dog needs to be flashed away with a light. Every so often, we will see a Mickey Mouse head but with a glitching effect. If we click it, Donald will force us to not be able to use the camera systems at all and could potentially make us lose. Minnie is essentially like Golden Freddy so when she appears, just lift up the cameras to make her go away. The final thing that we learn is that she, most likely mother, is impatient. Meaning, we do have a time limit on exactly how long we can stay here. My favorite part about this section is that this game doesn't necessarily delete all the other characters from the previous game, but instead brings them back here as shades. These shades are essentially the ghosts of the previous characters since they were eaten up and fused with an hourglass. I'll talk about Hourglass more soon, but just remember that this area most likely isn't real and is just part of our imagination. One final thing for this section, don't be like me and spam click out of anxiety since if you do that, on your best friend, you will be jump scared and lose instantly. Overall, this was a pretty interesting feature that almost feels like it should be its own game in all honesty with how amazing the different mechanics mesh well with each other and the cool feature of using some sort of hide and seek mechanic with the Mickey Mouse heads instead of the conventional 6am. With this being the first time I believe I ever saw a second chance feature within a FNAF fan game before, which felt pretty cool and terrifying when you suddenly get thrown into this new area, though it could feel pretty RNG based due to how the head spawning is pretty random. After a while, we can make it to the other side, and when the sun rises. Being such a peaceful scene after such a hectic night, contrasting the moment extremely well. The morning sun has driven them back into darkness. The first night isn't over yet. We are now dropped off into these tunnels 
completely in the dark, with our only source of light being this lighter. Within its location, we are able to hear something walking around us with its heavy footsteps. Which is something that I absolutely hate and love about these kinds of games since it forces you to have your sound extremely high up in order to really know which direction this thing is coming from. Sound is extremely crucial for this section, as when we turn off our lighter, we are able to hear which direction we need to run towards, which will lead us to this door that has a key inside, similar to the mechanic from A Shadow Over Freddy's, with this room being what I believe to be the only place that's truly safe within its location. What's another cool feature is that the map in the top left corner only appears when the lighter is on, so you can't really cheese this section. The only thing I hate about the gameplay here is the fact that you're forced to use the mouse for movement. Instead of moving around with WASD or the arrow keys, you must turn and click on the direction you wish to go towards with your mouse. This is probably just a personal preference in all honesty, but still was something that slightly bugged me the entire time while playing. Though with how well designed this atmosphere and sound design felt, I could give it a little bit of a pass. If you aren't able to invade whatever is hiding in the dark, just be prepared for a scare. This is Hourglass, or at least the slowing to king version of Hourglass, which was something I definitely was not expecting as the enemy hunting us within the tunnels. If you don't remember, Hourglass was the final boss within the previous entry and was an entity that had all the tunes, except for the face and the undying, fused together to create them. Which also created one of my all time favorite designs ever made for a FNAF fan game with how terrifyingly unique his design felt. I may not enjoy the current state of its design, but I can understand why they changed him up because like I said, he was found in these tunnels slowly decaying, and his new changes definitely reflect that perfectly. Something I should really talk about since it was something I saw quite often was the game over screen, which was something that generally felt oddly beautiful. Using cut up pieces of paper to spell the words, it really felt fitting for the setting and story of this game, showing just how much thought was put behind every single feature. After getting the key, you'll need to make it back all the way to the starting location in order to finally end night one. Every single thing we just talked about was just the features and mechanics that were introduced for the very first night. Something that you should get used to pretty quickly is reading from the notepad at the beginning of each night as it gives very important information on how to deal with the various different tunes being introduced. Here we are told to listen to sounds within the attic, which can be tricky since there's so much noise going on already from the flipping of the cameras, using the music box, and even just erasing the doodle forming on the notepad. The first new tune is known as the Corrupted Face, a distorted version of the face that has returned from the last game. The way we get rid of him is to hold the lighter towards him, but once we do that, he'll move to a different part of the attic, needing us to repeat this process pretty quickly. By itself, this mechanic isn't that difficult to manage, but like I said, with everything that's going on around us, the introduction of the Corrupted Face can make things quite tricky, especially since we need to walk up into the attic manually to check up on him, leaving all the other characters to come after us while we are distracted. The second thing the notepad tells us is to simply use the flash if we see a new creature on the camera systems. I just want to state that I absolutely love Disembodied who was just a Donald Duck head in the last game. His gimmick was pretty annoying, but it was quite funny the way he would just pop up and quack really loudly. So with the understanding that most of the previous cast was being scrapped for the new ones, I didn't expect Daisy to take his place, which much like Donald, is only a head with her using tentacles to walk around. When we use the cameras, she will sometimes appear in random locations, and if you stare at her too long without using a camera flash, she will just teleport into your room making extremely weird quacking sounds, disabling the camera systems for how long she stays with you, causing all the other tunes AI to become much more aggressive and come towards you faster as well as temporarily breaking the camera she was just on, even after she leaves. Simply put, she really screws you over if you don't use a flash quick enough, as although she can't end your night herself, the others most likely will. Making her one of the most annoying tunes to deal with due to the amount of noise she makes and the variety of things that she messes with. Old Donald just made loud sounds and that was really it. I miss you Donald. 
One final thing before we move on, and that is if we allow Willy to come towards the dog so we can actually see him through the window, which is something that I found quite funny and unsettling. Due to how he just does not look like he belongs there, with how his black and white textures don't feel right with the colors of the world around him. After a few attempts of getting used to the new mechanics, this night isn't really that difficult, allowing us to finally make it to the morning, letting the sun drive away all the creatures back into darkness once more. I won't be talking about the tunnels or the postmortem sections again, since in all honesty, they're the same for most nights. Still, it doesn't change the fact that these parts are absolutely terrifying when they do pop up. The instructions for this night are simple. You cannot let her into your room. Use the flash. There's only one new tune introduced for this section, who is Photo Negative Mini. I was wondering how they were going to show her off since there was a massive overhaul and differences in graphics between this game and the previous one. And well... You might be thinking, hey, that actually looks pretty cool. Why do you sound so sad about her design? To be honest, her original was just iconic. Did it look dumb? 100%. But did it look terrifying in the worst way possible? Yes, this was something that was horrifying but in the most unintentional ways, and I absolutely loved that part about her. In all honesty though, there was no way they could have replicated the design without making it seem extremely out of place in this kind of setting, so it's understandable why they didn't want to commit to the older model. The way she works, she will begin hanging from the ceiling in Camp 2, kind of like a ghost, and start making her way towards the office. Unlike Daisy, who will just disappear completely after using the flash and teleport randomly, Minnie will just go back into one room, but at least she will be predictable in her pathing since she will walk straight towards you, much like Willy. This can be a little bit difficult to manage since the flash in each room does have a little bit of a recharge time, which could cause Daisy to decide to pop up in those locations if you aren't careful in tracking of where you just used it. There isn't really anything new presented, so we're just going to combine this section with Night 4 as well. The notepad says someone new is in the attic. He does not like the light. Leave him alone. This is one of the most frustrating mechanics right behind Daisy, especially for me who likes to do things quickly when stressed out in horror games. Pete is introduced where he's essentially the exact same as the corrupted face, where he decides to make a noise in the attic showing he is there. However, you cannot turn on the lighter or else he will instantly jump scare you. Fun fact, P was actually one of the oldest running Disney characters made way before Mickey Mouse. I find it kind of cool that they decided to try to show up more of the older characters within Disney inside the Treasure Island series. Still though, this mechanic was more annoying than anything else, especially due to how many times this one tune decided to end my night. More than eight times just for night four. <laughs> Anyways, the second warning tells us the music will work on a creature that comes to your window. Dippy is an interesting case, as he does not enter a room through the door like most other tunes. Instead, he's trying to break through the window from the outside. He starts on Camp 8 and will make his way towards the docks. Fortunately, we're able to lure him away simply using a music box, so we don't really need to worry about him all that much. In fact, a good strategy I found is sometimes to make Willy walk around until he's close enough to our room, which intersects with Drippy in order to trap them together in a loop. Though, this could be extremely risky, as if you mess up, one of them may slip under the radar, which could result in getting to you much easier. Slowly, the combination of all these different mechanics together creates a stressful but coherent gameplay loop of checking the cameras, erasing the doodle, frequently looking within the attic, and making sure we don't mess up with the camera flashes. After this night, we make it back to the tunnels once more, but things don't end like they used to. Once we get the key and make it back like the previous night, something different happens. No. 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 No! What did you do? They were children. My children. I took them under my care. I protected them. 
They did nothing to you people until you. They didn't know why you were doing anything to them. They didn't even understand what you wanted. They were scared. And you killed them. You people shouldn't have come here. I shouldn't have led you. I've seen what you people do before. Everything that you do here. Every time your team meddles in something they can't understand. Every time they push and prod and hope to deep. You don't even realize that the grass you step on the air you breathe. It's all me. I've always been here. Every single time. Even if you didn't realize it. Even if you didn't recognize me. I have been here forever. Okay, there was a lot to unpack here. First, the beautifully animated scene of Hourglass getting trapped in a room and burning. Wow, just, just wow. That was one of the best animations I have seen in a FNAF fan game, truly showing just how much work was put into this project. I really can't put into words just how much that one scene caught me off guard with the sudden jump scare and the fire, combining elements of horror with action to really elevate the story to a level that I generally did not think was going to be possible while playing this, only to top it off with Mother's speech. We have gotten many glimpses of Mother throughout the previous game and have even gotten jump scared by her by the end of night one, but I believe this is the first time that she has actually spoken to us directly. It is crucial to note that the series has been rewritten over and over again, changing many different characters and parts of the lore to become much more comprehensive due to the early stages of the series being in its early development. One of the more important changes that we need to recognize is the deletion of this entity simply called God, who is a woman shown to be completely white with no eyes and no other defining characteristics. What the plans were for this character is unclear, but with a name like that, it was theorized that she would have been the creator of all the tunes. However, this was changed and remade into a character who was just called Mother. A Mickey Mouse silhouette with two white circular eyes. We essentially get confirmation that all the tunes were her children. How exactly she created them is still unknown at this point. What's a cool hidden detail thrown in is after the death of Hourglass, she says you killed them, not him, not it them, as most likely multiple entities since that was what Hourglass was. A distorted, melting amalgamation of many of the different original tunes combined into one entity. I'll try to make a section at the end trying to explain everything that has happened lore-wise within the series since I generally became more invested in the story after this one scene. Night 5 has one of the most interesting bosses in any FNAF fan game. The notepad tells us she behaves like her children, the one with the eyes will still come to the attic. He is not under her control. Trust your instincts. Do not get tricked by fake sounds. You 
can do this. Most of the tunes have been entirely replaced with Mik Mik, who is actually an entity that Mother transformed into in order to come after you directly. Which I feel was an extremely genius way of subverting expectations as making the iconic Mickey Mouse as we know him today to be the final boss was something I never would have expected. Remember, this was a game series based on the original abandoned by Disney Creepy Pasta, which entirely focused on this photo negative Mickey Mouse in order to draw fear from that specific character. There was definitely other elements, but the main focus that a lot of people were fascinated with was definitely with the blurry picture of this mysterious suit, which was something that the previous game did heavily depend on for its appeal. However, in this case, I think most of that is gone. Let me try to explain. The first Treasure Island game was made within the abandoned Disney Park attraction from the Creepypasta, and had many different characters and easter eggs that depended greatly from knowing the original story to fully enjoy it. Of course, you could play it since it was quite an enjoyable experience, but with the knowledge of the Creepypasta, all the little secrets thrown in gives the entire game much more spice to love it. Here though, it is still borrowing elements from the original story and the previous entry, but transforming it to be its own little thing. Not being afraid to expand on lore by cutting off certain iconic characters in favor of new ones, which is why we make it to Mother's new form, Mick Mick, who I'll just be referring to as Mickey since it's just easier. There's nothing inherently wrong with this design, in fact, it feels kind of like a normal Mickey Mouse model with off-putting eyes. But that's all she really needs to be, with most of the fear factor coming from how unsettling this character looks within the camera systems due to the lighting and how creepy it would be for a person wearing this mascot suit standing in these dirty decaying locations. I absolutely love the simplicity of her new design. Now, to talk about how her gameplay actually works, she starts in Camp 1 like Willy and makes her way towards the office. The way this boss works is seeing whether or not her eyes are visible. If you can see her eyes, use a flash in order to cause her to move back a room. If her eyes are gone, then the music box will be able to lure her away. That is not all though. If you use the music box to lure Mickey away, Mother will still be able to appear as a silhouette, needing you to flash her quickly and if you don't do this fast enough, she will corrupt the camera which is extremely similar to how Daisy functions, except Mother will be much faster and any camera she corrupts will not repair itself at all for the rest of the night making her one of the most dangerous entities in the entire game due to how game changing it could be to have more than one camera completely shut down for good. Like I said, most of the tunes were replaced and Bilal is no exception, as instead of her manifesting on a notepad, it is now Mother. Though it is important to note that unlike Bilal, if she completely manifests then she will just instantly jump scare you, ending your run. We're not done with Mickey yet. If you've been proactive with watching where Mickey was the entire time, then they suddenly disappear, do not check the attic. Sometimes she will just teleport straight into the attic and just entering that location will result in a jump scare, so it's even more important to know where she is at all times. If you wait a few seconds though, she will teleport back to Cam 1 like nothing happened. Talking about the attic, the corrupted face changes to become the ink blot face, who is essentially the same character except a lot more decayed. He functions the exact same, but you will need to put the light on him multiple times before he finally decides to leave. P no longer shows up on night 5, so we don't need to worry about him since Mother took that role for herself. 3am, things change slightly. Her Mickey design has a second phase, which on paper kind of looks goofy but in practice, looks terrifying within the cameras. By itself, it definitely wouldn't be a design that I would care much for, however, for how it looks within the environment of the messy cabin with the long limbs within the dark, it just feels right, but in the worst way possible. Especially on Cam 9, which makes you feel weird looking at this image, with how amazing the graphics look with the grainy feeling of the cameras, when Mickey is on that dock, it almost looks like a real image. I absolutely love this game, if you couldn't tell. Now, when she changes forms at 3am, she'll move a lot, and I mean a lot faster, throughout the cabin. Though, this could lead to one of the most frustrating moments, which is Mickey being in the attic at the same exact time as a face. With how quickly she moves, she will enter the attic a lot more frequently, which is something you will need to watch out for since at the same time if the face is in there, there really isn't much you could do, except hope she leaves the attic before you get jump scared by the inkbot. There's a couple of strategies you could do to beat this knight since it could be quite tricky. 
the easiest one I found was to immediately try to lure Mickey to Cam 9, the dock, since you'll be able to see her through the window very clearly, allowing you to know when she has teleported straight away to the attic or has moved to a different room. With this method, all you really need to do is try to manage keeping her within that corner, while also frequently checking a notepad as well. Keep this up until somehow we lose because of the fate since the thing is going to be the bane of your existence during this night, or somehow survive until the morning. With the ending seemingly showing us setting the entire cabin on fire with mother inside, not being able to escape. Okay. There's still so much I still haven't talked about, so let's get into it. Before I get into trying to explain everything so far, I just want to bring up a couple of things. For one, the voice lines. Oh wow, the voice lines could, that could be heard throughout the night are just so amazingly crafted and such an improvement from the previous entry. You could skip this part, I'll leave a timestamp, but they're just too good not to include within this section. Hey, wanna see my head come off? Don't be afraid. It's me, it's me, Mickey. I've got a hat on my head. She's angry. My life, I want it back. Don't believe me. Everyone who was involved with making these deserves to get praised. Now, to explain everything that has happened so far, to begin, we have to go back to the previous entry, where Jake Smith and the rest of the cast traveled to Treasure Island in order to investigate the abandoned park. They made something called the SSA, or the Supernatural Studies Association, in order to help study random paranormal incidents. At the beginning of the game, we already know that there was four members in total. Jake, we play as, Greg, Lisa, and finally, the final member, Henry, who went missing. They got permission from Disney themselves in order to investigate and collect any data they wanted from Treasure Island. At first, they found something very interesting, which was the moving suit of photonegative Mickey Mouse, believing this to be maybe a ghost possessing a costume, but that turns out to be a lie since later, they confess they don't actually know what they are. On the next night, Jake gets a panic call from Henry who asks him to get him from Pirate's Cove. What's probably a really messed up fact is that Henry was told to go investigate the island by Lisa and Greg. Afterwards, he went missing and presumably abandoned by these two, which later would cause you, the player, to take his place. Eventually, for whatever reason, the various different entities would come together and fuse into one singular creature known as Hourglass. For a purpose isn't really clear, but we know that the photonegative Mickey Mouse, Disembodied, Oswald, Minnie, and Goofy were all sucked in together. I'll explain the importance of this soon. Jake has one final moment with Hourglass before escaping to the basement, where he finds a vault to which one of the weirdest moments can be seen. A room full of sketches and a drawing board is found, before Mother comes in contact with us. We can only truly make theories about what exactly is happening in this moment, which is what we're going to attempt to do. Most of the designs within the first and second game have this melted wax feeling to them, as if they were created to be a sculpture but are slowly dissolving. There is only one entity that we have seen that's clearly different from the rest, who is Mother herself. Instead of presenting herself to be some sort of being, similar to a drawing, she almost feels completely digital for some reason. I believe that this is intentional, almost as if we're trying to look at something like her in the real world. Leading to two different theories that I have, 
Mother was an entity, we don't know what kind, but she was some sort of supernatural being found on this island that used to live here for quite a long time. It wasn't until people decided to build on Treasure Island that she started to change appearance to fit more like the Disney mascot that she began to see everywhere. Eventually, using her power on this drawing board to create an artificial family, though she couldn't really mimic the same designs as the original cast, only creating distorted versions of them, with my second theory being that Mother was in fact created by the same drawing board and that is why she seems to be the best put together character who isn't decaying. She was made by someone human and with a lot of experience with drawing. Being the only one to ever exist like herself, she wanted to make a family, so she began to draw and replicate the same designs as the ones found next to her. Though she could never create something that wasn't imperfect due to her limited understanding of how to replicate character designs. Nonetheless, she loved the creations, as if they were her own children. She didn't kill Jake when she came in contact with him for some reason, instead opting to scare him off the island. Though for some reason, he stays within that cabin, resulting in him burning hourglass. Something I mentioned briefly was a post-morm sequence is actually made of these things called shades, which were the ghosts of the tunes that hourglass was made out of. Now, I don't think this is necessarily relevant or canon, since this seems to be just another world that is a quote unquote other side, or even just Jake's nightmare. Continuing forward, we see Mother manifest herself in a physical form of Mick Mick to try to end Jake, but after a long fight, eventually the sun rises and Jake sets her and the entire cabin on fire. Though, there are so many questions still unanswered. What actually was that drawing board that was stuck inside that vault? Where did Mother come from? Weren't Greg and Lisa outside the island, so how did they get caught? And most importantly for me at least, who was the person writing those notes in order to help us each night? I just want to state that all the information and story that I found and used for this section were just from the games themselves, from the first and second entry. I'm not using any outside articles, not using any cancelled games, not using anything that I don't believe to be fully canon. There could be some parts that the creator themselves has said that was canon, but for me, I'm just going to be typically using the games that were released officially, which were Finance at Treasure Island and Oblitus Casa. Now, even with all these questions, this was one of the most enjoyable fan games I have ever played, and I generally wish there was more to it. Well, hopefully that feeling can be fulfilled, as there's actually a sequel being planned out and in development currently called Nightmare Below Disney. Not to be confused with Nightmare Before Disney, which surprisingly was another project created by the same team. However, it was cancelled eventually. We don't know much about this new endeavor, but its game jolt page was recently updated, and at the time of recording the script, it was posted just 13 days ago, being a couple of unsettling concept art with the caption, The nightmare doesn't stop until you wake up. Most likely going to be basing their ideas from what Finance of Freddy's 4 and Finance of Candy's 3 did, by having a heavy focus on nightmares. That's all I could really find about this new project. So far, the first game was really good, but the sequel managed to create something that turned out to be one of my absolute favorites ever, making it one of the scariest sequels out there. If you liked this video, like and subscribe. Comment something down below about your favorite character design, something you liked, something you hated, just anything down below. In the meantime, I've been talking for so long, so I'm going to go take a nap. Until next time. A quick thank you to Ori, Krev, Ryan Broes, Samuel Petunias, Beyond, Appletree, Angel GCXS, Shyplier, for supporting the